I'm Molly Steenson. Um, thank you for coming. Thanks, O'Reilly. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm going to bombard you with information for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so, so let's see how this goes. There's a lot of stuff I want to get through. Um, and uh, I am, I think, as, as you can see, I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon School of Design, and I'm an architectural historian as well as an interaction designer. And for a long time, I've been pondering this question, which is, what does artificial intelligence have to do with architecture? Um, and a corollary to this, I ran into Christina Woodkey. Everyone here knows who Christina Woodkey is, founder of Boxes and, Bar Boxes and Arrows. I ran into her yesterday and told her the name of my talk, and she said, that's absolutely bonkers. They have nothing to do with each other. AI and IA have nothing to do with each other. She's wrong. <laughs> so what does AI have to do with architecture? And the fact is lots, actually. It has lots to do with architecture. Um, it has to do with architecture as physical and digital. It has to do with how we conceive of artificial intelligence, the idea of symbiosis and augmentation. Um, I want to bring a couple of people um, up as case studies today. I'll talk a little bit about Douglas Engelbart, Christopher Alexander, and some of the people that he, um, he influenced. Nicholas Negroponte and the Architecture Machine Group, which was the predecessor to the MIT Media Lab and Richard Saul Werman. And I've got about 80 slides, so let's see how this goes. Maybe more than that. So architecture, this is a view of uh, an apartment I had about a decade ago in San Francisco that probably nobody can afford to live in anymore. Um, but I liked it, I used this picture because this is near Golden Gateway and it was, it's an arcology. It's a weird um, contemporary 60s era architectural community. And, um, when we think of what architecture is by definition, these are the kinds of definitions we might see, that it's building or constructing edifices of any kind for human use, the action or process of building structures that result. This is typically what we think of. But starting in the late 1950s, computing started using the term architecture. And it started referring to things like the conceptual structure and overall logical organization of a computer or computer-based computer -based system from the point of view of its use or design. It even goes back further than that. John von Neumann in 1945 with the Edback computer um, referred to the way that you organize a computer system and its organization of logical elements as architecture. We could consider what someone like Frederick Brooks said in 1962. He's who the Oxford English Dictionary credits for using architecture in a computer sense. And what he described it as is computer architecture, like other architecture, is the art of determining the needs of the user of a structure and then designing to meet those needs as effectively as possible within economic and technological constraints. And I find it very interesting that when we talk about the design of complex systems, we turn to architecture and architectural metaphors as a way to do it. So let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. And my, my research tends to focus on the history of artificial intelligence, what is also called good old-fashioned AI, or GoFi for short. Um, this is the version of AI that existed until the 1970s, the big ideas when people believed we'd be able to model the brain with computers and we'd be able to understand thinking and we'd be able to do this very, very easily. And it turns out that it is actually not easy at all. And now we've finally begun to have the ability to actually build some of these ideas that people were talking about. I like these pronouncements. People like Marvin Minsky, who in 1901 said, I believe that we are on the threshold of an era that will be strongly influenced and quite possibly dominated by intelligent problem-solving machines. He said this in 1961. So these ideas, things like human-computer symbiosis or uh, man-computer symbiosis, as J.C.R. Licklider described it in 1960, was the hope that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way, that, in a way not approached by the information-handling machines we know today. Again, these ideas start sounding contemporary. They start, start sounding like things we might see today. But 50 plus years ago, these were the ideas 
that were, that were going on. So this is the notion of symbiosis. And Licklider's idea of symbiosis was the operative way that we talked about interactivity until the 1980s. This was such a powerful, potent idea. So if you haven't read this piece, Man-Computer Symbiosis, go find it on the internet. There's also the notion of augmentation. Not that computers would take us over, but that we would work together with computers in order to produce something that was better than both of us, than each of us alone. The sum of a computer and a human working together. Early AI was a notion of heuristics and problem solving, setting up a problem so that it could be solved stepwise. If you haven't read the book, um, if you haven't read the book How to Solve It by George Polia, take a look. It's um, the, it's where the notion of heuristics come from, written in 1945, and it's about making. It's about imitating the steps in solving a problem. If we were able to de develop computers that could do this, we would have evolution and learning and development and AI as a result. And it's about visualization. Um, the, being able to visualize a problem so that you can solve it is an important concept. So this is something that we're going to see as I start talking about Christopher Alexander's work. But we started seeing this in the 1960s as an operative, um, as an operative part of AI. And then finally, again, evolution and learning. Machines start not as fully formed adults, but kind of like children, right? And then we teach and they learn over time. We've heard a couple of talks. I don't know if you saw Mike Kuniowski's talk yesterday or Alexis Lloyd's talk. We start seeing ideas of how machines might learn and how intelligence might manifest. Some potent ideas. All right, so let's talk about a couple of case studies. Um, I want to start with Douglas Engelbart. And Douglas Engelbart was um, one of the first AR, um, AI researchers. He was at the um, Stanford Research Inst Institute. Um, and he's responsible for developing things like the mouse. Here's his, uh, his assistant, his lead engineer, um, William English, testing the first mouse. He's well known for this mother of all demos from 1968. But I want to go back before then. I want to go back before then and talk about Douglas Engelbart and architecture and artificial intelligence and a proposal that he put together called Augmenting Human Intellect. And um, this is, it was a project that he did called Augmenting Human Intellect, a conceptual framework. He published it for the Air Force. And um, he, considered, he, he considered what a computer system might be like that worked in tandem with its users. So the thing that we ultimately got to with the mother of all demos, this amazing demo of an online system that word processed and could do all these things, this is the germ of the idea. And here's how he describes it. He starts with architects. He envisions an augmented architect at work. Again, 1962, this precedes Sketchpad. This precedes a lot of things that we know of early computer-aided design, this idea that an augmented architect sits at a working station that has a visual display screen some three feet on a side. This is his working surface and is controlled by a computer, his clerk, with which he can communicate by means of a small keyboard and various other devices. He is designing a building. He has already dreamed up several basic layouts and structural forms and is trying to connect them on the page. And then he goes and explains how it would fill in the data that he would need, the surveying information he would need, the, the architect at work. He'd be able to manipulate different views. There'd be one part of a screen with some information and one part of a screen with graphic information. This is a contemporary metaphor. We know it now, but this was before anybody had ever seen it. And he, he used this as an example because it could be transferred into other kinds of realms, right? So he said, every person who does his thinking with symbolized concepts, which includes the form of the English language, pictographs, formal logic, mathematics, should be able to benefit significantly from a system like this. So why did Engelbart start with architecture? And I think a lot of things, but one reason is because architecture is about building worlds. And when we're envisioning building a world, we turn to architecture and architectural metaphors as a way to talk about it. So let's talk about Christopher Alexander. Um, who here is familiar with Christopher Alexander? A lot of people. Um, just a little bit of an introduction. Christopher Alexander is a mathematician and an architect. He's still alive. He was born in 1934. Born in Vienna, raised in, raised in England, um, was at UC Berkeley for a long, long time. Founded something called the Center of Environmental Structure. 
Um, he is loved and revered by interaction designers and computer programmers. He is reviled and hated by architects. They don't like his moralizing tone, but uh, he's, he's a vital person, and, um, and for better or for worse, I will be studying him for a long time to come. And what I think that Alexander did throughout his life work was he created an operating system for architecture. And I'll tell you a little bit about how this worked out. Um, so I mentioned that he was trained as a mathematician. And in 1964, his first book was published. It's called Notes on the Synthesis of Form. How many people here have read that or thumbed through it? OK. Um, and then in 1977, the book that he's probably best known for, A Pattern Language, um, which he wrote with a couple of, a couple of his colleagues at Berkeley, came out. And um, in between, he kind of works with computers and then gets rid of computers, coming up with this operating system for architecture. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Um, when he was working on notes on the synthesis of form, he was also working on a couple of other things, like a set of highway designs and using a computer to chunk through a set of requirements in order to figure out the best, most pressing design problems. Basically, he really wanted to use a computer. You don't need to use a computer for this kind of thing. And in order to do this, he had to set up the design problem as something that a computer could help him to solve. He had an idea about what design was. Design isn't about making a form or making something necessarily that looks like a drawing or a building. But at this point in time, he was interested in defining the structure of a design problem. And what he said is that the form is a part of the world over which we have control and which we have decided to shape while leaving the rest of the world as it is. The context is that part of the world which puts demands on this form. Anything in the world that makes demands on the form is context. And fitness is a relation of mutual acceptability between these two. So if you've talked, if you've heard, um, if you know who Mark Reddig is, for instance, Mark Reddig's design firm Fit Associates is named after this idea, this idea of fitness between um, form and context. And the role of the designer is to make bad fit go away, right? Ameliorate the misfits in a design problem. So good design is the absence of bad fit, is what he says. But as I mentioned, he wants to use a computer at this point in time to do it. And that's because he's really into set and graph theory. And that's what his computer allows him to do, is calculate arrays and put together a graph. And in 1962, 1963, he was able to do two relationships per node, which meant that he would end up with a tree. Okay. In 1964, he is able to do multiple um, nodes, and therefore he's got a much more complex information structure, and he starts saying how wrong trees are. He, he kind of contradicts himself over and over. Um, and what you see here is a set of specific requirements in something like the design of a tea kettle. So you'd break down all those requirements and chunk them together into logical groups, and then ostensibly the designer would know where to focus her attention. He also um, focused his attention on things that we know of here in the Bay Area quite well, like the design of the BART system. Um, he worked on 390 requirements for BART before they were fired. Um, he and the civil engineer on the project were fired. They didn't find this a useful working method. But the way that this wouldn't work would, would be to combine all those requirements and then, as I mentioned, to come up with a tree diagram. And this tree, tree diagram will look familiar to anyone who's ever done website information architecture. It's the operative approach that we, that we use. Zooming in a little bit, showing how this works. He was very keen on being able to do this. And then he, as I mentioned, throws that away and starts talking about semi-lattices. I think actually, as I look at his work, what he was actually doing was social network analysis pegged to architecture. But I told you that I would talk today about artificial intelligence. And this is something that Alexander was interested in and is referring to in 1964 in Notes on the Synthesis of Form. He's taking a look at people like Herbert Simon and JCR Licklider and Marvin Minsky and these ways that maybe you could create an intelligent system for architecture that would be stable. OK, that, that could face change. So he says, we must face the fact that we're on the brink of times when man may be able to magnify his intellectual and inventive capability, just as in the 19th century he used machines to magnify his physical capacity. Um, I'm going to skip over that right now. Um, 
so jumping ahead to 1979, throughout the, the 70s, he works with the Center for Environmental Structure, and he gets rid of working with computers and stops trying to structure design problems in that way while taking the logic of computation into the rules of the pattern language. Who here has heard of design patterns? Exactly. So this is the man where they, this is where they come from. Um, and this is how Alexander and his colleagues defined a pattern. They said that each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over without ever doing the same thing twice. So this is how it works. A pattern language is about this thick and um, each pattern has a title, a number, it exists in a hierarchy that I'll show you in a second. There are sketches describing the design problem and statements describing the problem. Um, there are, there's an asterisk there, which means they're very sure about this particular pattern. If there are two asterisks, they're not sure. They think it's still in flux. And, um, and they try to describe the pattern in such a way that if you were going to be designing something involving row houses, you might, you might find some truth in this. And so this is where the notion of design patterns comes from. And all these patterns exist in a hierarchy, as I mentioned. So they start with something as big as independent regions and agricultural valleys, and then they move into greater and greater detail, moving into things like living rooms or bedrooms or porches or sleeping areas. And these patterns are a network. So he can't really visualize a network computationally at this point. He doesn't need to. He's come up with the rules and the structure to do it here. So here he sees, this is from Timeless Wave Building, which accompanies um, a pattern language. It's the philosophy of it. And it shows how these things all kind of interrelate. Um, a pattern language and notes on the synthesis of form were really influential to these two individuals as well as to the gang of four who are the first people to start putting patterns, using patterns as a way to describe object-oriented programming languages. Um, Kent Beck and uh, Ward Cunningham first used this for small talk. For small talk. And then um, it gets picked up by, as I mentioned, the gang of four. This book comes out in 1994. Um, Beck and Cunningham started doing this work in the 1980s. And eventually, he's so influential that the Object-Oriented Programming Conference invent, invites Alexander to keynote. And Alexander is like, well, it's well and good that you're doing patterns, but I think you're missing the broader question. The thing that I'm really interested in is order and objective goodness. He believes that you could actually objectively uh, and quantitatively find goodness and order. He still believes this. Um, and he's interested in the moral component. He asks, does, he asks programmers how they're going to sort out the broader issues of goodness in the things they do. As more and more of the world is computerized, how are they going to have an impact on that? It's a good question. When I interviewed Kent Beck about it, he said that it was, an, it was a rearrangement of the political power in the design and building process. And if you want to know where else this ends up, it also ends up today in lean processes and agile and extreme programming. And it ends up here. It was directly influential for Ward Cunningham uh, in the development of the wiki format. And um, this is, again, the expansion of patterns. So um, we also don't have a notion of users and user-centered design with that, Alexander. Um, Terry Winograd, the HCI professor at Stanford, published a book called Bringing Design to Software in 1996. It came out of a set of conversations that began before the commercial web happened, like late, no, early 90s. I think I want to say like 91, 92. And um, what I find interesting about this is he keeps referring to the idea of patterns and inhabitants of software, right? He says software is not just a device with which the user interacts, it is also the generator of a space in which the user lives. Software is like architecture, software design is like architecture. When an architect designs a home or office building, a structure is being specified. More significantly though, the patterns of life for its inhabitants are being shaped. People are thought of as inhabitants rather than as users of buildings. And in this book of essays, they approach software users as inhabitants, focusing on how they live in the spaces that users create. 
We don't have these notions without Alexander. Um, and Alexander is so much patient zero for interaction design that I can't even find out the first person who starts referring to him in this way. Now, Terry Winograd was actually, Terry Winograd ties into what I'm going to talk about next, which is, um, let's see if this will play for us right here. Um, this, is, uh, this is Terry Winograd's dissertation at MIT in the AI lab in the early 70s. It's a project called Shurdlu, and it's a simulation, but um, it's a natural language interface, um, dialogue-based conversation about manipulating pieces in a blocks world. Um, AI research in the 60s and 70s took place in these limited kind of confines called blocks worlds, where you could um, focus on certain things and abstract others. Um, this was the main, one of the main ways that AI research took place till about the mid-70s. And um, this, is, this is a set of question and answers. So this, um, this is an eight-minute film that shows the process. And if you want to, you can download his dissertation from MIT's website. But this is what Terry Winograd was doing before he came to work on issues of HCI and issues of cognition. So I think it's, it's useful to realize that these points cross over. Strangely, he did not actually cross over or seem to know uh, Nicholas Negroponte when Nicholas Negroponte was at MIT. So most of you, if, you, if you're familiar with Negroponte, you'll know him as the founder of the MIT Media Lab. Um, but before the MIT Media Lab, he did a master's in architecture at MIT. And, um, and five days after he graduated, he started teaching in, um, first in mechanical engineering and computer-aided design, and then eventually in the School of Architecture. Um, he's still on faculty today. And he founded a group called the Architecture Machine Group. Um, he also wrote a lot about this idea of an architecture machine. The first, um, the first book he had about it, titled The Architecture Machine, was dedicated to the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. And I like this because he's always gesturing and you always see his hands in the, in the images that he takes. Um, he worked very, very closely with people like Marvin Minsky and the AI lab. And the Architecture Machine Group was the prototyping designer, tinker, architecture wing of AI in this period of time. Worked very closely. Um, so pay attention to this arm. You're going to see it again in a little bit. Um, so strangely... Apparently, Negroponte and Winograd did not cross paths. They both say this. But Negroponte worked on a project at MIT. Um, the first architecture machine group project was called Urban 5. And it was supposed to be a dialogue-based design system um, that used 10 foot by 10 foot blocks. And you could put them together. And you can see this kind of question and answer dialogue going on here. You could um, attribute certain kind of, at you could put certain attributes with it. Um, there's a therapeutic attribute and it says panic, you might see right there. Um, and you could say, you know, these, these blocks are going to function as, um, I don't know, a circulation area. These blocks are going to do um, something else. Oh, wait, I've really screwed up. I'm hitting the panic button. Um, just FYI, I have this book um, and soft architecture machines. I scan them in and they're available. Um, I'll tweet out the, the URL, but they're available in my Dropbox folder. Um, but Negroponte and Leon Groiser, um, who, he, who he ran the Architecture Machine Group with, found that this problem of natural language communication and interface was very difficult. And um, he writes about this pretty frankly in the Architecture Machine. I like this, Ted, many conflicts are occurring. Um, and he said that, he writes that the Urban 5 system had inexhaustibly printed garbage but it was at least a nice kind of garbage. It was a nice machine. Negroponte had some really interesting thoughts about interfaces that I think are worth considering in, a, in our robotic landscape today. Um, he wrote in The Architecture Machine that it is so obvious that our interfaces, that is, our bodies, are intimately related to learning and how we learn that one point of departure in artificial intelligence is to concentrate specifically on the interfaces. Does a machine have to possess a body like my own and be able to recognize, to experience behaviors like my own in order to share in what we call intelligent behavior? While it may seem absurd, I think the answer is yes. How we get information into the system and how we experience that information is a vital consideration. And I think he, he was saying this as early as 1970. 
However, there are some kind of dodgy projects that went on at this time. So this is, um, this is the cover of the software catalog from the software show. Um, it was uh, an exhibition in 1970 at the Jewish Museum. Um, in Boston. And the Architecture Machine Group displayed their project called Seek, which you see on the cover um, right here. And what you probably notice is a lot of mirrored blocks and a robotic arm and some gerbils. Do you see the gerbils? And it says gerbils match widths with human built environment. And the, the Seek's job was to stack up and move around blocks, right? Make order out of chaos. Gerbil's job? make chaos out of order. And um, the, there's a wonderful essay in here by Jack Burnham, just FYI, but I like this image, life in a computerized environment. But I think that this project also draws out some of the issues we have with models and computerized models. Um, Seek was not apprised of the humans or inhabitants, the gerbils. And um, I guess it bears mentioning that the entire software show was a disaster. It nearly bankrupted the Jewish Museum. I think only recently have they begun to do avant-garde um, art shows again, and Seek tended to kill the gerbils. So sometimes we fare poorly in the middle of an AI model. Um, this is a cover for a project for a proposal called Mapping by Yourself that I'll come back to in a minute. But I think that as as the architecture machine groups work progressed over the 1970s, they got more and more interested in simulation, intelligent simulation. And they had some very provocative ways of talking about it. Um, they coined a term supreme usability. We are proposing to develop human computer interfaces on one hand as sophisticated in conception as a cockpit, and on the other hand as operationally simple as a TV. From either perspective, the objective is the same supreme usability. Now it should be noted that after about 1976, the majority of Architecture Machine Group's funding is coming either from the Office of Naval Research or DARPA. And so these are, it's pretty clear what the end result of these are. These are battlefield technologies. They're simulation technologies intended to maybe keep soldiers off the ground or voters, as, uh, as one historian has put it. Um, and at the end of the day, it's still a military-funded project, so it's, it's worth considering that. Some of the projects they did in this realm include the Aspen Movie Map, um, and this is, uh, these, this is delivered by video disc, video disc, and it's Aspen, Colorado, and you would sit in this Ames lounge chair that they put joysticks into. Very classy. Um, and uh, you zoom through Aspen, Colorado. There were a number of master's theses and dissertations at this time. Someone did little films with people, so you could you know, ostensibly go and talk to people at each, uh, at each stop along the way. Um, the Google parallels are obvious. Um, here would be their Google car, the, the 1978 version. Um, if you ever have a chance to talk to Michael Namark about this, who is here in town, I, I heartily recommend it. Here's the, the Eames lounge chair in the Architecture Machine Group newsletter at the time, and Nicholas Negroponte sitting in it with a tablet computer. Um, I'll point out again that this is the 1970s, so you're seeing this decades before you'd see it somewhere else. Um, they also began to explore different kinds of interfaces. So gestures and gestural-based computing is still something we grapple with today. Um, this is a project called Put That There. And um, this is going to be where we have sound. Let's see if I can make this run. Pay attention. Can you? Go ahead. Load a map of the Caribbean. Load a map of the Caribbean. As you wish. This is a disc. I'm holding your picture now. <laughs> Welcome to the Caribbean. I'm waiting for you. Pay attention. Go ahead. Create a red oil tanker. Where? There. Put a blue cruise ship. Where? East of the Bahamas. So you see there's some 
make a yellow sailboat. Here. Where? North of that. Create a green freighter. Where? East of the sailboat. Create a magenta trawler. Where? There. Put that. Where? There. So put that there. Um, it's abstracting certain elements, it's learning, um, and it's responsive. Um, and this was something that they, you, actually there's even a write-up of this in Stuart Brand's book about the Media Lab, so this project stuck around. I also want to point out that this is all taking place in what was called the Media Room. Um, it was a dark carpeted room with a huge screen in front, um, a touch, two touch screens here, a tablet computer and octophonic sound, as well as this gesture recognition, um, uh, gesture recognition and kind of pointer mouse thing. They also um, created some of the first layered digital maps. In fact, I think it was the first layered digital map. And uh, this is a project called Mapping by Yourself that was led by Guy Weinseffel. He is an architect in Boston. And um, I like the fact that it looks like an iPad and you can still see an IBM Selectric typewriter and a push button phone um, in the background. They considered a couple of different form factors for this, incidentally. The, the, um, one of them is the Scandinavian chic model. One is the um, folded sheet, military chic, and Star Wars. This was right when Star Wars came out. So anyway, I, I point all of this out to, uh, to underscore how interaction design is actually born out of this relationship between AI and architecture and the way that all of this rolls into the media lab um, and the first four, four labs of the media lab came out of the architecture machine group. Uh, and some of these people are still there today. I now want to change gears a little bit and talk about the notion of the architecture of information and um, where this term came from. Um, the term actually was not coined by Richard Saul Werman. It was coined by Peter McCullough, who was the president of Xerox, and I believe that he used this quote in the creation of Xerox Park um, when he announced its launch in 1970. And um, this is what they, what he said, he said, to find the best means to bring greater order and discipline to our information, thus our fundamental thrust, our common denominator, has evolved toward establishing leadership in what we call the architecture of information. So this is what Xerox's structure, what Xerox's um, core interest was going to be over the, the decades to follow, different ways to do that. Well, Richard Saul Werman picks up the idea, and... Um, and he's interested in, instead of information design, uh, the architecture of information. That means something tactical sometimes, such as this is a, a set of projects he did with Joseph Passano. He did a beautiful atlas, it's about like this big, called um, 20 American Cities. And this is a set of feedbacks, as he described it, for what might be interesting to um, a policy person or a designer. And um, he says of this, of this particular map that it was organized visually, systematically, and mathematically. Thus, in this form, it can be factored, aggregated, projected in time, and reproduced by automated methods. So it mapped different kinds of demo demographic and um, different kinds of data about cities. Um, his interest, though, is in, um, in the architecture of information has something that's very social in nature. And he directed two conferences long before he started the TED Talks. Um, in uh, 1972, he led the Aspen Design Conference under the name uh, The Invisible City, and he describes this as, we live in the invisible city, a place where public information is not public, a place that is not maintained because it is not creatively used. And then his big tour de force was an American city. He 
led the 1976 AIA conference. This is the major architecture conference for architects in the United States in 1976. And what he said here is, what he was interested in doing here was highlighting the relationship of information in the city. And he says it takes information, information about what spaces do as well as how they look, information that helps people articulate their needs in response to change. He had the conference take place all over Philadelphia in all sorts of different places. He had all kinds of people speaking. He had Jonas Salk speak. Jonas Salk gave a talk on the visualization of complex ideas, the guy who came up with the polio vaccine. Um, William Fetter, who's one of the fathers of computer graphics, gave a talk called Computer Graphics and the Urban Perception. And you know, these begin to sound like talks we'd hear here. Um, and Marley and, John, and uh, Ronald Thomas gave talks called The Architecture of Understanding and How to Spec an Interface, Detail an Input, and Supervise a Programming Process. This is 1976. They never let him near another AIA conference again. <laughs> and they don't let them take place all over cities anymore either. But I put this out there because I think it's useful to ponder where it came from and the very architectural and urban nature um, in its roots. And if this isn't clear and obvious, um, he is also an architect by training. All right, so AI, IA, IXD. I've wanted to point out here that AI really did not develop in a vacuum. And AI needed design and architecture because it demanded processing power. And it was explicit. It was a small group of people who funded and worked on this stuff. Um, in fact, it's largely one funder at the Office of Naval Research who realized what AI is like today. And it was developed for these creative uses from the outset. This is always how we've imagined it. Contemporary AI needs design and architecture. Um, I find myself at a university with the best artificial intelligence research in the country, if not the world, and the best robotics research. I live in a city where continually, every week, it seems like another um, R&D facility is opening. Um, the latest one is Oculus Rift. But I want to know how they start reaching back out to designers and architects like us in order to bring this stuff to life. But likewise, I think that design today needs to work with AI. So. I'm an educator, and I want my students to understand that AI is a material, that conversational interfaces are vital, that natural language processing or machine learning needs to be something that they learn how to work with. I don't know how yet, but I think that it's got to be there. And indeed, we do need to make that material of AI, the material of interaction design. We also need to point out that how we model a system reflects our philosophy of design. We see this a lot in Nicholas Negroponte's work in the Architecture Machine Group. And I think that it's vital to look back in order to look forward. These early models of AI, in some ways, are really coarse and naive, but there was an integration with it. And I think that we can look there in order to look for ways that we might teach, experiment, tinker. Again, I find myself wondering, how do we teach this stuff? How do we enable the two to work together? So this is the way to come to understand, I think, what AI and design mean, or at least it's a couple of jumping off points. Thank you.